Okay, we'll, we'll start this afternoon's proceedings. A very good afternoon to everyone and thank you all for being here. Uh, the Center for Policy Research has had a long association with Mr. Jairam Ramesh in his many avatars, uh, in a, when he was Environment Minister, um, later as Minister of Rural Development. Uh, in our role uh, as policy researchers, um, we've, we've interacted and engaged with him, learned from him, occasionally perhaps contributed to some of your, no, let me say, occasionally contributed to provoke you to argue back with us. Um, uh, but uh, what's, what's been even more wonderful about this long association is that we've been able to continue this association not just in the policy sphere, but also in the sphere of ideas, of histories, uh, and of understanding India better. And I think in the last few years, uh, Mr. Ramesh has not only uh, taught us a lot of about policy and politics, but has also become, I think, India's foremost chronicler of some of the most important actors in India's post-independence history. Uh, you were here last July, I think, uh, when we had a very, very uh, insightful conversation on your book on P.N. Huxar. Uh, and now it's a real privilege for us uh, to be able to welcome you back to talk to us about your latest book, A Checkered Brilliance, The Many Lives of uh, Mr. V.K. Krishnamenon. Uh, for all of you who are interested, the book is outside, so if you don't already have a copy, please do make sure to purchase one. Um, and what makes today even more special is that Ambassador Das Gupta, who's uh, uh, one of the most uh, prominent members of the Center for Policy Research's board, is here to be in conversation with Mr. Ramesh on this book. So I'm going to hand over to you, Ambassador Gupta, uh, Shikhar Das Gupta, to take the conversation forward. Thank you very much. It's a privilege to uh, take part in this conversation with Mr. J. Ram Ramesh. Uh, Mr. Ramesh, this is your third biographical work, and your first comprehensive biography, um, a Life in Nature, uh, shed new light on a on a very important aspect of Mrs. Gandhi's work, very important dimension, something which, uh, about which not much was known before you wrote that, uh, that book. Uh, your next book, Intertwined Lives, dealt with what was probably the most productive period of Mrs. Gandhi's career, the, uh, that part of her career when she worked in close cooperation with P.N. Huxa. Uh, who was a principal counselor during, during those times. Uh, but these uh, addressed a certain dimension of the, of the work of Mrs. Uh, Gandhi, uh, or a certain period in her, in her time. Uh, this is the first comprehensive biography in the sense that you deal with your subject, uh, Krishna Menon, Right from the time of his of his uh, of his youth, his childhood, as uh, the son of a of a of a wealthy landlord family in Kerala, to the years of his uh, to his impecunious years in London, um, where he was an advocate of um, of the cause of Indian independence, to uh, to uh, Krishna Menon's. Uh, uh, heydays as minister uh, in the Indian government and as the leading foreign policy representative of India at that time. And then uh, <laughs> after his days as a famous international state, uh, statesman, his fall from power. And this is an exceptionally important work. It is meticulously researched and it, it draws upon a mass of newly available archival materials, in particular the post-1947 Krishna Menon papers, but also a lot of other ar archival material from other countries. And it is extremely ambitious in scope because it covers almost half a century of uh, modern Indian history from the 1930s to the 1970s. And it provides a magisterial account of the life and times of a highly controversial subject. So what was it that led you to this subject? 
Was it the availability of unexplored archival records, the fact that the Krishnamenon papers, post-1947 papers, became available for scholars, or the complex and fascinating personality of the subject, or Krishnamenon's contribution to India's diplomatic history? Well, uh, all three, Ambassador. Uh, but let me say that I'm delighted to be back here and as I was explaining to Yamini, uh, there are very few subjects on which Manishankar and I agree, although we both belong to the Congress Party. But Mani and I both agreed recently that Ambassador Das Gupta is perhaps the most scholarly foreign service officer that both of us have had the privilege of knowing. So thank you, thank Ambassador. You. Uh, yes, I think the availability of primary material was the fundamental reason for embarking on a biography of a man who's been written about, who's been written about basically on the basis of interviews, oral history, uh, experiences, and so on. Uh, he figures, for example, in Ambassador Rasgotra's uh, autobiography as well. So he figures. It's not as if people don't know about Krishnamanan, but I think the availability of archival material in the Krishnamanan papers, and um, as I discovered, in archives across the world, uh, on matters relating to Krishnamanan, particularly in Scotland Yard, of which he was a favorite subject, um, at, in various universities in the UK, where successive UK ambassadors, uh, high commissioners to India, deposited uh, their reports back home, particularly Malcolm MacDonald, who figures very prominently in this book, uh, and the opening up of archives in Russia uh, and China both of which, which offered new material on events associated with Krishnamanan. So I think the availability of primary material was the overriding reason. The second reason is that any, any scholar, any aspiring scholar, any student of Indian political history cannot ignore Nehru, and anybody who, who's studying Nehru cannot ignore Krishnamanan. From 1935 to 1962, for a 27-year period, Krishnamanan was uh, Nehru's soulmate, ideological comrade, and perhaps the man uh, closest to Nehru in terms of ideas, ideology. He was part of Nehru's innermost family. Uh, in fact, Nehru's family consisted, in my view, of Nehru, his daughter, and Krishnamanan. Uh, and um, very close to Nehru's son-in-law for many years. So he was part of Nehru's household. Uh, and therefore, to understand the evolution of Nehru's own thinking uh, on matters relating to Indian independence, uh, on relating to Indian foreign policy, and subsequently in the last five years on India's defense and policy vis-a-vis -vis China, particularly, Krishnamanan is absolutely a critical figure. So I think the, the, the fact that he was as consequential as he was during the Nehruvian era uh, made him a subject for study. And thirdly, of course, is the fact that, you know, you write biographies of interesting people. Uh, you know, you don't write biographies of colorless people. And, you know, he he was an interesting guy. He had, you know, I described the uh, India League as a one-man, many-woman army. He, you know, he had, he had this great... Women fell for him in, in large numbers, usually left of center, LSE educated, uh, and subsequently also after he came back to India, he was irresistible. Um, men resisted him, but women were irresistible to him. Uh, controversial, you know, sharp tongue, wrote excellently, but Ambassador played crucial roles uh, in in turning points of Indian history, whether it was the negotiations relating to the partition and transfer of power, in which he plays a very important role as Nehru's aide, on India's remaining in the Commonwealth, overcoming Nehru's own ambivalence uh, and the Congress Party's um, extreme reluctance for India to continue in the Commonwealth, uh, the role as a global envoy when he was known as Formula Menon, uh, irrespective of which foreign crisis there was, Krishnamanan, who was not liked, was listened to. Uh, and he came up with solutions on many a crisis, including Korea and the Suez Canal. And of course, 1962, which is the, the one defining uh, image that all Indians still have of this man. And we look upon him really as the villain of 1962. So I think, you know, to, in order to deconstruct such a person, uh, a biography uh, was absolutely essential. And that's really the reason why I wrote this book. Thank you very much. Now, uh, 
you mentioned Krishna Menon's closeness to Nehru, which made him, uh, um, which made him relevant, really, in Indian politics. Uh, now, you've, you cite some of Krishna Menon's friends in London as describing him as a good Britisher and a true Indian. Do you think this description applies in some measure also to Jawaharlal Nehru? Not in some measure, in full measure, Ambassador. <laughs> in full measure, both Nehru and Krishna Menon were good Britishers but true Indians. Uh, and they, they had, uh, their best friends were British intellectuals, usually of the left. Uh, they read British authors. They had very many British women friends, uh, Edwina Mountbatten being one common a friend of Nehru and, and Krishna Menon and many others. Uh, so they were, they were absolutely British in their response and they both bemoaned Pax Americana. They would have been more comfortable with Pax Britannica, but after the Suez Canal uh, episode, Pax Britannica sort of you know, vanished in smoke. Uh, so they were, they were comfortable with, uh, with Britain. They were more comfortable with Britain than they were with the United States. Uh, they were both democratic socialists. So yes, I mean, the fact that both of them were educated in England, uh, both of them were bound uh, by English friends, of which two people play a very important role in the lives of both Nehru and Krishnamanan. One is Harold Lasky, uh, and the other one is Stafford Cripps. Uh, both of them very integral to the Indian independence movement mid-30s, integral to the life of Nehru and integral to the life of Krishnamanan as well. But there's one more figure, Ambassador, which who does not get the attention she deserves uh, and who I think, in my view, was the initial uh, drawing, uh, sort of a magnet for bringing these two people together, was Annie Besant. Uh, you know, uh, Nehru becomes a a member of the Theosophical Society when he's 13 years old. And he, he's introduced to the world of books, he's introduced to the world of intellectual pastimes by his Theosophical Society tutor, Ferdinand Brooks, uh, in, in Allahabad. And he's personally initiated into the Theosophical Society by Annie Besant herself. Krishna Menon's first mentor is Annie Besant. Uh, and Krishna Menon is actually firmly anchored in the Theosophical Society right through his life. Uh, and it is Annie Besant who really introduces, who discovers Krishna Menon, uh, who takes him to London for six months. He, he ends up staying there for 29 years. Uh, so Annie Besant was another very important figure uh, which sort of bound these two personalities together. And you can, as you can see, Harulaski Britisher, Stafford Cripps Britisher, Annie Besant, Irish woman, uh, come and settle down in India. So they, you know, they, they were, they were British in every sense of the term. Right. But they were Indians. I mean, they were fiercely Indian. Otherwise, do you see a certain uh, divergence in the paths they follow after the outbreak of the war, and more specifically the Quit India movement? Because here. Uh, I mean, and you've got a billion description of that and account of that, uh, where Krishna Menon tries to persuade Nehru that it's in the interests of Congress and the independence movement to cooperate with the allies in the fight against fascism. Uh, and uh, I, of course, this was one thing which brought Menon and Nehru very close together during the Spanish uh, uh, Civil War, for example. And here, Nehru explains that in Indian conditions, it's not practicable given Gandhi's position. And then during the war years after Quit India Movement, while Nehru follows this path, the Congress path, uh, Menon uh, is actually, uh, uh, how should I say, he, he, he follows the, 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 the British path, as it were, uh, which calls for cooperation with the, with the communist states, with, with the Soviet Union, and therefore also with the British left, including the Communist Party. And there's a brief sort of uh, distance, period of distance between them, which closes again in 47. Absolutely. Absolutely, Ambassador, you're 100% right. I think Menon was foxed by Gandhi. 
he never understood gandhi never understood gandhi he was perplexed by gandhi gandhi's statements gandhi's positions and he writes to nehru you know i don't understand you know what, what this man is doing and nehru patiently replies to krishna menon explaining to him the significance of gandhi uh, the complexity of gandhi and what uh, the importance of what gandhi says the hidden meanings and the not so hidden meanings um, nehru was firmly ideologically he may have been close to krishna menon but i think uh, he was anchored in a gandhian world he saw i mean he saw the indian freedom movement uh, in the indian context as exemplified by gandhi but unlike gandhi and perhaps only other congressmen uh, who approximated nehru in his thinking in this regard was netaji subhash chandra bose yeah. uh, i think that that's the commonality between bose and gandhi and nehru both of them saw uh, the congress's struggle against britain as part of a worldwide struggle against imperialism and colonialism and that's how you know krishna menon also uh, uh, was uh, you know made his positions very clear but you're absolutely right nehru wanted to go with krishna menon but nehru was very much constrained by uh, gandhi patel prasad you know raja ji the whole congress position and he expresses his frustration that he cannot go the full hog and as you know krishna menon uh, if right from when the war starts uh, he is very much uh, in favor uh, of the british line you know that we need to defeat the forces of fascism represented by mussolini and hitler uh, and that we need to support the brits now it's very interesting ambassador from 1939 to 1941 um, he alone uh, he's very friendly with the british communist party uh, in fact the only party that is arguing for full indian independence throughout the 30s is the british uh, communist party and he forms an extraordinary relationship with the british communist party leaders of which rajni palmedat is certainly the most prominent and harry paul harry pollet also is one but rajni palmedat is the most important now between 1939 and 1941 there is a slight divergence of opinion between the british communist party and krishna menon but after our operation barbarossa starts in june of 1941 the british communist party also comes around yeah. and says that britain must cooperate yeah. right so after 1941 the situation is somewhat different uh, but you are absolutely right uh, he uh, krishna menon is simply not able to understand why the congress party is not coming out unequivocally in support of britain uh, and nehru's position is, is well if britain wants to fight for democracy globally they must first give independence to india i mean you cannot delink these two positions and that was that was one period in which i think there was a divergence of view between men and and, and nehru but subsequently after 1941 things got restored and particularly after the quit india movement you know things begin to fall into place uh about the commonwealth <coughs> you have highlighted krishna menon's contribution of course to keeping india in the commonwealth after it became a republic in 1950 uh, why was he so keen on india staying on in the commonwealth was it basically for sentimental reasons his attachment to britain or was there a careful calculation of the national interest was he concerned for example that if india were to leave the commonwealth and pakistan were to stay on uh, it would tilt the field against us in the sense that we were totally dependent on britain at that stage for military supplies for supplies of petroleum uh, uh, of course there was also the kashmir issue in the uh, in the un so was it more sentimental reasons or were there sound calculations of national interest or was it a combination of both uh, there was sentiment ambassador but ultimately it was a cold blooded decision in the national interest uh, you know there's a long letter he writes to nehru saying that we don't want uh, india to be in the outer circle and pakistan to be in the inner circle so i think that was a very important factor uh, that you know he saw pakistan as an important player in the british commonwealth that would give it 
an advantage over India, an India that's still dependent was still dependent on the UK for its essential defense supplies. And, and you have made a very important point. In fact, one difference between Nehru and Menon on Kashmir was that Nehru always saw Kashmir as an India-Pakistan issue, whereas Krishna Menon saw Kashmir as a larger geopolitical issue related to, uh, he talks about the Anglo-Persian axis, he, he talks about uh, the growing uh, you know, confrontation between, the inevitable confrontation between the Soviet Union and the U.S. and the U.S. mollycoddling Pakistan uh, and thereby, you know, taking on an advantageous position vis-a-vis -vis Kashmir. So, you know, he saw, he saw that in a geopolitical context. And I think it was not just sentiment uh, that led him to the conclusion, even though Mountbatten and Cripps were, you know, pressurizing him uh, repeatedly that India must remain in the Commonwealth. But I think apart from sentiment and friendship, it was cold-blooded calculus for India's economic interests. But on, on, on the Commonwealth, I should say one thing, Ambassador, which is not generally known. Uh, the general mythology is that Krishnamanan was responsible for India remaining in the Commonwealth, but the precise formulation was not Krishna Menon's. The precise formulation came from Gopal Samay uh, you know, and the, the whole debate was, how would you reflect the role of the king? Uh, uh, you know, and the Clement Attlee and the Brits wanted the king to be the head of the Commonwealth, which was unacceptable to a Republican India. And finally, it was Gopal Samay who came up with the formulation, the king as a symbol of the association of the free peoples. Uh, that was the exact phraseology that was used to break the impasse. So it was actually, the formulation was Gopal Simi Iyengar's, but the, the lobbying inside uh, the, the conference room was Nehru, of course, uh, as prime minister, but accompanied by Girja Shankar Bajpai uh, and, and Krishna Menon. One, another unknown story is that Krishna Menon was responsible for Girja Shankar Bajpai's appointment uh, as secretary general, the first secretary general. Uh, you know, he writes to, uh, Nehru asks him, do you know Girja Shankar Bajpai? Uh, and Krishna Menon writes a long letter to Nehru. His let letters were never less than four pages long. And he wrote a long letter extolling the virtues of Girja Shankar Bajpai and how in spite of being an ICS officer, uh, Girja Shankar would be a great addition to India's foreign service. And I think that made up Nehru. Nehru's mind has already been made up. Uh, you know, he was using Krishna Menon as a sounding board. And Krishna Menon, I think, reinforced Nehru's thinking that Girja Shankar Bajpai should be the first Secretary General of the MEA. Absolutely. In fact, there was strong opposition. I mean, while it was agreed generally that ICS officers should be kept on uh, after independence, there was a very strong feeling that an exception should be made of Girja Shankar Bajpai yes. because of his role in London during the war, or his, what was believed to be his role which is running down the Congress party. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you've pointed out in your book, Krishna Menon strongly endorses Gidya Shankar Bajpai for his exceptional ability. And uh, the, this Gopal Swami Iyengar, that's a very, it, it's completely new, what, you, what you've revealed, this, uh, this formula. The king as the, uh, as, as the symbol of the Commonwealth rather than the head of yeah. the Commonwealth. And what uh, Bajpai and Krishna Menon did, and they are usually given the credit, as you pointed out, you know, rather unfairly, is to marry the two phrases, which is to say the symbol of the free association of the, of the nations of the Commonwealth and uh, head of the Commonwealth by adding the words as such. So the final formula adopted in London was symbol of the free association of its independent member nations and as such the head of the Commonwealth. That was the bridging formula which uh, these two words produced. Now uh, coming to Krishna Menon's role as a peacemaker and uh, as you mentioned uh, he established a huge international reputation because of uh, his role in, uh, in uh, Korea, the armistice uh, in Indochina, in Geneva, and later during the Suez Crisis. Um, now, um, you pro pro provide a fascinating account of his role. You've pointed out that it was Krishna Menon who first proposed 
the creation of a neutral nations repatriation committee uh, to resolve the vexed question of POWs in Korea. And this was certainly a substantial contribution. But um, what is not very clear is what precisely was his role in the Geneva negotiations on Indochina. We know he was extremely active. He, was, he had innumerable meetings with all the principal protagonists. Uh, he had no official role. It was a self-appointed sort of role as a go-between. The conference outcome, it is true, it, it, it was a guarantee of sorts for the neutralization of Laos and Cambodia. And this was India's objective in the negotiations. We'd got it accepted by the Colombo Pass, and, uh, and it figures in the final thing. But can we attribute this to Krishnamanan's uh, actions alone? Because this was also part of the British position, unlike the, the American position. Um, and I uh, ask this because, you know, in the Nehru papers, I haven't seen the Krishnamanan papers, but in the Nehru papers, there's hardly any reporting from Krishnamanan. Just one vague report, you know, which essentially says that he's much sought after in Geneva, but no substantial reports. The substantive reporting comes not from Menon, not from our mission in Geneva, but regular weekly reports from Anthony Eden. Uh, so wh what did you find about his, uh, you know, the substantive? Well, to understand what Krishna Menon did in Geneva in 1954, in the months of May and June 1954, when the Indo-China peace accords finally materialized, one has to look at the dispatches of K.S. Shelvankar in the Hindu. Uh, Shelvanka was Krishna Menon's number two in the India League, uh, strong leftist, uh, married to a British communist leader, so ideologically very much part of Krishna Menon's world. And Shelvanka uh, was basically reporting back what Krishna Menon was telling him. Yes. Uh, and so if you read the Shelvanka dispatches, which was almost every day, Hindu would have it on the front page. Uh, you know, the front page in the Hindu, the right corner, would be K.S. Shelvanka. And you will see that you know, there's Krishna Manan talking. Nobody else would be talking. Uh, you're right, Ambassador. It's very difficult to pinpoint precisely uh, what Krishna Manan actually accomplished in, in, at Geneva. He, but there were two things. One is, he was the only man who was meeting everybody frequently. I mean, he had a total of 150 meetings, uh, and he met Eden, he met uh, everybody, I mean, or the American delegation, Walter Beadle Smith, uh, and then, of course, he met Chow and Lai for the first time, uh, and then uh, Pham Van Dong uh, of, of Vietnam, and Pierre Mendes France, who paid him handsome compliments at the end. If you were to ask me what was the substantive contribution that Krishna Menon made at Geneva, it is the idea of the ICC the International Control Commission. That was the one uh, idea that emanated from Krishna Menon. And you, as you very well know, as Ambassador Rasgotra also would know, the International Control Commission, one consequence of Krishna Menon advocating that was that India became the chairman of the ICC, you may recall. And they were there was an ICC for Laos, and there was an ICC for Vietnam, and there was an ICC for Cambodia. That, in my view, was Krishna Menon's actual tangible contribution, apart from the fact that he, uh, you know, met Eden, would meet Chow and Lai, then he would go and meet Biddlesmith, and he was, you know, he, he, he took ideas from one, tried to play the role of an honest broker, but the one idea that got embodied in the final declaration in Geneva was that of the International Control Commission. And that, I think, in my view, uh, as a tribute to Krishna Menon's role, Krishna Menon had yet to become as controversial have, as he would uh, so a year later or two years later, and largely as a tribute to Krishna Menon's role and to Nehru's own role, India was offered the chairmanship of the ICC, and India became the chairman of the ICC. Chauvin Lai actually uh, comes, goes from, from Geneva uh, to Peking via Delhi. He breaks journey in Delhi. The, he has a discussion, and I think that's when it was decided that the China would also come on board. So, the China, Because the big question was, will China agree to the ICC? And finally, the ICC got agreed. It had a 
series of very distinguished chairmen, as you know, uh, at the ICC. G. Parthasarthi, I think, was chairman. Uh, M. J. Desai was a chairman. Uh, many, many distinguished chairmen that the ICC had. So the ICC is is one institution that Krishna Menon was responsible. Just like the NNRC, right. the Neutral Nations Repatriation Commission, which was the key which broke the logjam as far as the Korean Peninsula was concerned in late 1952, early 1953. Right. I think you've put your finger on the spot. Uh, the ICC was, you know, the, what uh, Christian Menon added to the conference. Uh, actually, uh, you mentioned Juen Lai's role. Juen Lai, one of the reasons why he passed through India, partly it was to prepare for Bandung, but the other thing, as we now know from a cable that he sent to Mao, and which uh, was released under this uh, Woodrow Wilson, Wilson. Yeah, sort of thing. You know, he says that he wants to use Indian influence with the British and the Commonwealth countries to push this idea of neutralization. Uh, and you're absolutely right also that this is when, you know, because Nehru d d uh, takes up this Laos and Cambodia question with it. Of course, Juen Lai has to go back to get the North Vietnamese to agree on this neutralization formula. But this ICC is absolutely right. You know, you've uh, brought out what uh, his main contribution was. Suez and Hungary, he... But before you go to Suez, hmm. don't skip 55. Because, 1950, uh. because 1955 is the, what I would call, the apogee of Nehruvian influence uh, in the world. And in 55, Krishna Menon accomplishes, tries to accomplish, almost accomplishes something which Kissinger accomplished in 1971, for which Pakistan got all the credit and is still taking the credit for that. He almost brought about a rapprochement between the US and China. He goes to China for eight days, he secures the release of four imprisoned U.S. airmen, meets Eisenhower twice in a space of two months, and more importantly, meets John Foster Dulles six times in a space of five months. I mean, I don't think it's been equaled by any Indian subsequently. But as you know, the politics of the U.S. militated against a rapprochement in the 1955. But in 55, I think, Krishna Menon and Nehru and by definition, Nehru, were at the peak of the, of the global influence. Uh, yes, that's absolutely true. But <coughs> this uh, 1955 initiative, don't you think it owes more to Juen Lai than to, uh, than to uh, Krishna Menon? It was Juen Lai who suggested that Krishna Menon go to China because he had in mind this idea of a rapprochement with the United States uh, and this offer to release a certain number of the airmen, not all of them, uh, as a concession to, to the Americans. In fact, there's one thing about our China policy in those days. Uh, we, uh, and this is a controversial thing, so uh, you know, I'm probably wrong, but let me put this to you uh, as one way of looking at things. Uh, we assumed that peace and tranquility in the Far East was in our national interest. An alternative view could have been that tension on China's East would have mentioned, would have maintained, would have been conducive to peace on our northern frontiers. And uh, that was not a view that we took. Was it a wise decision altogether? Why was our, were our interests not served by us maintaining a certain amount of tension? We didn't have to create it. All we had to do was not to get involved in it. Certainly, we could have espoused the cause of China's admission to the United Nations, giving Beijing the China seat. But need we have gone out of our way to, to try and see peace in the Far East? I agree with you. The, right through the 50s, the notion, or the Nehruvian notion was peace in Southeast Asia is essential for peace in South Asia. That South Asia cannot be divorced from what is happening in Southeast Asia because it will be Vietnam, it will be Laos, it will be Cambodia, then it will be Burma. And then it will be India's choice. I mean, that was the that was the thinking. That was you know that was there very evident in the thinking. 
And remember also, Ambassador, you know this better than me and many others, the northern frontier doesn't figure uh, in the Nehruvian and the Krishnamanan worldview vis-a-vis -vis China till 57 or 58. It's really after 57, 58 that things begin to heat up. We are still in the mid-50s uh, in, a, in a state uh, at a time in which we look upon China in a benign way, not, a, not as an expansionist power. Uh, I think that comes a little later. Uh, and you're absolutely right. Uh, the credit for 1955 should actually go to the Chinese prime minister who, uh, got, to know Nehru, uh, who got to know Krishnamanan in Geneva, uh, met him in Bandung, invited him in Bandung to come to China. And Shao Lai was smartly playing uh, Krishnamanan off against Hamishal. Hamishal wanted the credit. Uh, he also knew that Krishnamanan was in search of credit. So he allowed four airmen uh, for Krishnamanan, and he allowed some other airmen for Hamishil, but Krishnamanan was the first. And there was a lot of bad blood between Hamishil and Krishnamanan as a result of that. Uh, so yes, he was using Krishnamanan, uh, but I think in 55, uh, there was a genuine effort on the part of the Chinese uh, to seek some sort of a modus vivendi uh, with the Americans. But I think it's very clear from a reading of the meetings of Krishnamanan and uh, Foster Dulles particularly, that the domestic political environment in the US militated against a 1971 type of an initiative, which finally Nixon you know, sort of finalized in early 1972. With the benefit of hindsight, yes, we were soft. Uh, we were soft on the Chinese in the 54 to 57 period. It's only after 58 uh, that, you know, Krishnamanan, uh, Nehru and Krishnamanan, in fact, I would say Krishnamanan, is, uh, Nehru is far more uh, cold-blooded when it comes to China than he's given credit for. He seemed to be a romantic on China. He's not. I think Krishnamanan is more of a romantic on China than, uh, than Nehru was. But until 1962, uh, Krishnamanan is peddling the idea uh, of, of a swap of a lease. Uh, we recognize your sovereignty on Aksai Chin, uh, and you recognize our sovereignty on the Chumbi Valley. Nehru would never do this. I mean, Nehru was listening to it. Nehru didn't bat for it. Uh, if Nehru wanted to support it, he could have he could have gone ahead. And in fact, in 1960, Ambassador, as you know, uh, when Chang Lai comes to India for that last visit in you know, of April 1960, Krishna Menon is not even on Menon's uh, on Nehru's side. The man who is selected uh, by Nehru at the, at the insistence and pressure of Govind Pant to be his chief aide was Sardar Swaran Singh. And you know, if you don't want an agreement, you get Sardar Swaran Singh because you know you can keep on. He would used to be. I mean, Swaran Singh was notorious for filibustering, and Swaran Singh was the key figure from the Indian side. And not only that. Nehru says, okay, you've come to India, now go and meet Moraji Desai. Now, can there be more, uh, much more of a, Chauhan Lai goes and meets Moraji Desai, he meets Govind Vallabh he meets Radha Krishnan. This extraordinary situation where you're exposing a visiting uh, a prime minister who's come in search of an agreement to the three biggest opponents of any agreement. And I think Nehru, that was a calculated move on Nehru's part to show to Chauhan Lai, look, my, I am not a free man. I have to carry these people along with me. You may be talking to Krishna Menon, but Krishna Menon is a maverick. He does not have the support of the Indian political system. So Nehru is far more shrewd than we give him credit for in relation to China. Uh, absolutely. I think that sums it up brilliantly. Nehru actually wanted to continue discussions with China on the formula which was offered by Zhu Enlai in 1960 and was dissuaded from doing so by the precisely the calculation that you mentioned. In your book, uh, you have thrown new light on Krishna Menon's swap proposal to solve the border issue with China that China acknowledges India's claims in the Chumbi Valley and India reciprocates in some manner in Aksai Chin. It's rather vague what he was offering there. And the unstated premise was, of course, that, uh, that what was then NIFA is non-negotiable. That is ours. And we do a swap, the Chumbi Valley, a little sort of thing there, and we give you something in Aksai Chin. And, um, it's interesting. In all the records that I have seen, NEFA doesn't figure. 
Exactly. Yes, Jumbi Valley in Aksai. Exactly. Because he's assuming the basis of the thing is that NIFA is not negotiable. Yeah. You simply accept it's ours. And uh, you write in your book, and I quote, in the 1950s, it was Krishnamenon alone who advocated a negotiated settlement on the Sino-Indian border dispute. Nehru was broadly supportive, but he was hamstrung by the position taken by his senior cabinet colleagues and indeed by the Indian parliament itself. The search for a negotiated settlement continues if and when that is arrived at, Krishna Menon would be vindicated. I think this is an extremely important sort of assessment and a very fair one, if I may you say know, the so. the man who opposed the swap form, and the man who was the most critical of Krishna Menon in Parliament, they were, everybody was critical of uh, any negotiations with the Chinese. Ironically, and I have never been able to understand till today, why even the socialists were against a negotiated settlement with China. I can understand the Jansung, but the socialists as well. Now, the man who opposed him, the maximum, and spoke out and wrote to Nehru against Krishna Menon's approach to China, goes to Beijing in 2003 and signs an agreement with his counterpart in Beijing yes. saying that we will appoint special representatives on the two sides to negotiate a border settlement. So in a way, I mean, Mr. Vajpayee came full circle from his position in the late 50s. I think 40, 50 years later, he recognized that this is a border that has to be negotiated and not settled by disputes or conflict on both sides. Um. Please indulge me. I'd like to read out something from your book because I think it's very, very important. And uh, this is uh, Ambassador Pansuli's report to Beijing on his meeting with Krishna Menon in July 1962. And uh, this is a quote from the Chinese Telegram. China's, uh, this is what Krishna Menon told the Chinese ambassador. China's final claims should be stated clearly. Some areas can go to China. At the same time, China can make some symbolic concession in other areas. And making modifications in this way, we can perhaps solve the problem. In this way, India can say to the public, some places have been given to China, and China has in other places made concessions. The Aksai Chin Road has perhaps a fairly big strategic meaning for China, or is perhaps related to Chinese face. Certain places here can go to China. In brackets and underline, the ambassador writes, this sentence was not said clearly by Menon. In other words, he was throwing out a hint of concessions in Aksai Chin but without committing himself to anything specific. So you could say that this is a lease or yeah. you know, an indefinite lease or something of that sort. But actually, a, a few days after this meeting with the Chinese ambassador, uh, Krishnamanan goes to Geneva uh, for you know, the conference on Laos. And he has the final meeting with Marshal Cheney, the Ch Chinese uh, defense minister. And... Uh, that was a meeting, uh, he had two meetings, he had a breakfast meeting and he had an official meeting. And uh, we don't know what was discussed in that meeting, although the Chinese record is there, which I have quoted. But Arthur Lal, who was the only man who was present at that meeting, has actually recorded this. Uh, and what Arthur Lal has written, I mean, there's no way I could verify it from the Nehru records. Arthur Lal has written that what was decided was that talks would continue. This is, we are talking of the 23rd of July, Ambassador, 1962. Talks would continue between both sides. The communique was sent back to Delhi for approval. Now, Nehru would normally approve any letter, reply to any letter in a matter of a few hours. But Nehru was traveling that day, and it took 24 hours for approval of that communique to come from Delhi, by which time Cheney had left, uh, and it was infructuous. I mean, there was no, there was no opportunity for it. So no communique gets issued at the end of that. But the draft communique was that the two sides would continue their negotiations 
without prejudice to their stated positions. So I think that was 19... Srinath Raghavan has called Ch Chauhan Lai's visit to India of April 60 as the last missed opportunity. I would say the Geneva meeting was in, indeed the last missed opportunity because five months later, the war, you know, we have the war. Absolutely. Um, now, still on China and uh, Krishnamanan's role as defense minister, uh, of course, he's coming for a huge amount of criticism in this call and with good reason. Uh, firstly, he was a part-time defense minister. As you've pointed out, he was in New York for half the time, uh, including points of high tension with China, and he'd go off to New York, uh, you know, for some meeting or the other. And secondly, because personality-wise, uh, he was not uh, really a suitable head for an institution which, which is hierarchical uh, in nature. You can't sort of take off uh, the chiefs of staff in the presence of junior officers, uh, you know, and expect the armed forces to take it. At the same time, you've pointed out the major contributions that he made as defense minister to indigenization of equipment, to, uh, to, uh, to, to domestic manufacture of defense equipment, tanks, self-loading rifles, and so on and so forth. Uh, the fact that he set up the DRDO, the fact that for the first time uh, there was a major diversification of the source of defense supplies, the MiG-21 uh, program. All these were enormous contributions. And again, as you point out, in 1965 and in 1971, we were to reap the, the benefits of these policies that he followed. Now, uh, yet he was forced to resign after the 1962 war uh, on account of his shortcomings. Uh, but uh, does the record suggest that Krishna Menon was a scapegoat for what was essentially a national failure in 1962? It wasn't the failure, just the, it was certainly a failure of the armed forces. It was a f national failure uh, for which the blame must be shared by all those in the cabinet, but also by parliament, the makers of public opinion in the media and academia, all those who rejected a compromise settlement on the border issue, while also rejecting the idea of diverting funds from development to defense. After all, it was Krishnamenon, as you've pointed out, who first pointed to the need for significantly stepping up defense expenditure following the induction of Pakistan into uh, US-sponsored military pacts. And he continued to press uh, as defense minister for additional funds and was given only a fraction of what was requested. In fact, there was a reduction even at one stage uh, by people like Moradji Desai, uh, who said that this would be, uh, you know, disastrous and you don't really need to build up your defense forces. And yet these were the very people who attacked Krishna Menon for, for, the, uh, for the failure in 1962. Well, I think uh, there are three questions there that you asked. Let me address each of them. One is his relationship with the generals, yes. uh, with the army, which, you know, played havoc in 1962. Um, uh, he's been made out to be a villain by the army because all the first books of 1962 were written by army officers. Right. Brigadier Dalvi was the first with Himalayan blunder. Uh, BM Call came out with Untold Story. And then you had that horrible book which has shaped world's thinking on China and India, unfortunately, to our detriment, Neville Maxwell's uh, India-China War, which is largely a figment of Maxwell's very fertile imagination. But the, so neither Nehru nor Krishnamanan had any opportunity of articulating an alternative point of view. Now, the fact is that in the initial two years that Krishnamanan was defense minister, the nation was excited. You know, we were getting aircraft carriers, we were going to manufacture tanks, negotiating for fighter aircraft. Uh, nothing was going wrong. 
we established the DRDO, uh, we started Sainik schools. I mean, this is one aspect of Krishna Menon which I have not mentioned, but I got a lot of letters saying that you have not mentioned the fact that he set up Sainik schools. It's true, he set up Sainik schools. So, you know, there was this, for the first two years, uh, Krishna Menon was, was, was seen to be this breath of fresh air. Because remember, Ambassador, uh, ever since Sardar Baldev Singh, the defense minister was not, uh, the first defense minister was Baldev Singh. Baldev Singh was seen to be a good man, but not an effective man. The second defense minister was Gopal Sengayangar, who was there for a very short while. The third defense, the third, uh, defense minister was Kailash Nath Karju, who was generally considered to be a completely inefficient man. Nehru was defense minister for two years. People forget yeah. that from 55 to 57, Nehru was defense Nehru wanted to get rid of the defense ministry and uh, Krishna Menon had, had written about defense, talked about increasing defense expenditure before he became defense minister. So it was natural that he got appointed. And for the first two years, he did nothing to disprove Nehru. 59, things begin to change. And things begin to change with Timaya's resignation on the 31st of August, 1959. And I think that uh, that is a is a is a clearly a break between uh, the top brass of the army and Krishna Maran. Two things happen, Ambassador, which people don't know, uh, and I certainly didn't know till I wrote this book. The news that Timaya had resigned as army chief was known only to Nehru, Krishna Maran, and Timaya. He resigns in the afternoon, but he withdraws his resignation a couple of hours later. Next morning, on the 1st of September, 1959, the only newspaper to carry the news of Timaya's resignation, big banner headlines, Timaya resigns, differences with Krishna Menon, was a statesman. The statesman was a British-owned newspaper, and most importantly, most importantly, the military correspondent of the statesman was General J.N. Chaudhary. Imagine, the number three man in the army is moonlighting for a British-owned newspaper for nine years without official permission. By the way, this is this this, this fact I got from Chaudhary's memoirs. Not I mean I've not manufactured this information. Chaudhary himself admits it in his memoirs, which came out much later, which really got unnoticed by then. So this news that Timaya has resigned leaked to the press, there is this huge, uh, um, you know, brouhaha and consternation in parliament. Krishna Menon is pilloried. Nehru comes out with a statement later on, and Timaya is uh, asked to take back the resignation. But that clearly, after then, the relationship between the two had completely broken down. This was also the time when a very colorful army officer, uh, you may remember, in Wellington, he was the commandant of the college, and he puts up a photograph of Robert Clive and Warren Hastings. Now, India has become independent in 1947. Uh, you have a man as a defense minister who is particular, he is British, but he does not want symbols of British rule in India. Uh, and Brigadier Manekshaw puts up uh, photographs of, of Clive and Hastings, uh, and his idea of a joke. It was not a joke as far as Krishnaman is concerned. He charge sheeted him and suspended him. So one after the other, it was Thorat, it was Timaya, it was Manekshaw, all British educated, you know, Sanders educated guys. The only person exception to this rule was B.M. Call. And that's why B.M. Call becomes the great favorite of Nehru and, of, and Krishnaman. Now, Timaya, to make matters worse, and this is really, in today's context, if such a thing happens, I don't know what the government would do to the army chief. A serving army chief tells the British High Commissioner that my minister is plotting a coup against Nehru. And he tells the British High Commissioner that Nehru was going to read out a statement that I had drafted, but he instead made changes at Krishna Menon's instance. All This is all there in black and white in Malcolm McDonald's report back home, which is now at the Durham University archives. So it was clear by then that Timaya and Krishna Menon had become sort of, you know, they were, whatever Timaya wanted, Krishna Menon would say no. And on top of it, you had Moraji Desai, 
as defense minister saying that any reorganization of defense any increased expenditure in defense is an insult to the mahatma's memory this was this this is there on record so you you were on the one hand you had an army system which was not playing which is not in sync with you and on the other you had political colleagues who did not agree that defense expenditure parliament acharya kripalani one of the bitterest critics of krishnamanan in 1962 all through the 50s is arguing for no spending on defense because it you know again the mahatma will be very upset and we have better things to do with our money than to spend it on tanks and, and aircraft and ammunition so this was the prevailing theology at that point of time and we paid the price for it in 1962 second was krishna menon the scapegoat undoubtedly undoubtedly he became the symbol i won't use the word scapegoat he became the symbol of all that had gone wrong that had resulted in 1962 nehru wanted to keep him nehru knew that krishna menon was not res- alone responsible for 62 he kept krishna menon's resignation in his pocket for 7 days and two people were responsible ultimately for krishna menon's resignation one was indira gandhi who went to the president of india radha krishnan and told radha krishnan please save my father from himself she prevailed upon the president to tell the prime minister that he should accept this extraordinary normally prime ministers tell presidents to accept the resignation here the president was telling the prime minister to accept a minister's resignation and the second event that forced nehru's hand was on the 7th of november 1962 at a meeting of the congress parliamentary party 370 mps one particularly maverick mp mahavir tyagi gets up and says pandit ji krishna menon ka istifa nahi lenge to aapko istifa dena hoga this was an open challenge by the prime minister's own congress colleagues more congress mp spoke out saying that you have to get krishna menon's resignation i think nehru realized that if he didn't accept krishna menon's resignation his own position would become untenable and that very evening krishna menon finally resigns the first time krishna menon did not ex- uh, nehru did not accept his resignation he transferred him as de- from being defense minister to minister of defense production you may remember that but on the 7th of november he makes a clean break and that's when he actually resigns so yes ambassador uh, parliament was at fault because there was no voice in parliament calling for a negotiated settlement with china nehru's cabinet was at fault particularly govind vallabh pant sk patil and moraji desai for putting down any idea of negotiating with china radha krishnan was at fault because radha krishnan also was a great hawk when it came to china as gopal's papers reveal nehru could be accused of not being authoritative authoritarian enough to impose his will uh, on his cabinet but as i have argued in the book after 1958 nehru is in his period of biological and political decline Uh, he is not in a position to enforce his will in his own cabinet, uh, and therefore, Krishna Menon really is a voice in the wilderness when it comes to China. Uh, and Timaya, his old Betanwar, writes in July of 1962. He writes an article in Seminar saying that a war with China is inconceivable and unthinkable. we should not be fighting a war with china we should settle our problems with china through negotiations and through political engagement so in a way yes he was he was a fall guy i think and but if he had not got rid of at that point of time nehru's own position would have been untenable raja ji who, who by then had become nehru's bitterest critic issued a statement saying that the nation wants nehru to continue but the nation wants krishna menon to go i appeal to my friend and colleague jawahar lal he calls him jawahar lal jawahar lal that he should ex- not stand on false prestige and accept krishna menon's resignation so i think there was a combination of factors that led nehru to realize that if he did not accept the resignation his goose was cooked a uh, very very fascinating account and very convincing account uh, 
In your book, you also deal with Christian Menon's last years in retirement and the dignity with which he conducted himself throughout this period. The odd thing is that despite all that had happened in those years, uh, he never seems to have completely given up hope of staging a political comeback. And I'll tell you why I say this. I had the privilege of meeting him uh, on two or three occasions after in his uh, years in retirement. He very kindly invited me for tea, two or three times, I forget. And on one, he was a charming person, I and mean, he could be extraordinarily charming. And he was also an extraordinary man because uh, our meetings took place in a room which was full of children's toys. There were these shelves, you know, full of children's toys, where he used to play with uh, children and so on. And uh, I was fascinated by, you know, by, by, the, by the conversation. And I made the mistake, the blunder, of asking him whether he planned to write his memoirs. And he blew up. He said, write my memoirs? Only retired politicians write their memoirs. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So, I mean, the, the man extraordinarily still at home. So I tried to sort of retrieve my, you know, to cover the, uh, the faux pas by saying, no, sir, what I meant is that, uh, you know, uh, nobody has contributed as much to India's foreign policy as you have, apart from Pandit Nehru, and he's no more. You are the only person alive who really knows the full background of India's foreign policy. This partly mollified him, and he said, he said, India's foreign policy? Is there such a thing? <laughs> this is the last word. But let me conclude with one final personal recollection. I was posted in our mission in London in 1974. And one of the odd tasks that came my way was to send to the Prime Minister in New Delhi a wooden crate and this contained Krishnamenon's papers, the ones that he'd left behind in London. And I'm delighted to find after all these years that this contrib has contributed in some small way to this magnificent work that we have produced. Thank you. <laughs> no, I, I, you're right. I mean, those papers, it took 26 plus 19, 45 <laughs> years for those papers to be declassified. Uh, you're ab absolutely right, uh, Ambassador. You know, power corrupts, but uh, loss of power traumatizes. Uh, and you must judge public personalities by not what they do when they are in power. You must judge public personalities by how they deal with the loss of power loss of office, loss of authority. Uh, and I think it, by that standard, Krishnamanan earned new friends. In fact, he got new image, he got respectability. And his worst critic, his worst critic, his worst uh, biographical critic was S. Gopal. Three volumes of Nehru are littered with venom on Krishnamanan, but at the end, Gopal is forced to write by the manner in which he handled his resignation and thereafter Krishnamanan elevated himself to a position of new dignity. So even Gopal acknowledges this. Uh, I don't think he, he saw the writing on the wall, Ambassador. He saw the writing on the wall uh, in 64. Uh, he saw that with the loss of Nehru, uh, he wouldn't have the same, uh, you know, the same clout. Uh, he had a brief, uh, he tried uh, Shastri almost made him foreign minister. Uh, you know, there is, a, there is a fascinating record of a conversation that Shastri had with Radhakrishnan, which I got from the Radhakrishnan archives, where Shastri comes up with this proposal to appoint him as foreign minister. Uh, that is to keep the left lobby happy, but that didn't, that didn't fructify. Radhakrishnan advised him against it. Uh, uh, but, you know, there was a brief moment when Indira Gandhi, um, in 1967, brings Haksar back. Because if you remember, Haksar was his acolyte. 
Haksar and uh, Krishnamanan go back to the 1930s. Uh, and Haksar served in the High Commission for five years uh, from 48 to 53. So there was a brief moment, but Indira Gandhi by then knew she was personally very fond of Krishnamanan, but she knew that politically, uh, you know, he was a spent force and he would, he would create problems for her. Uh, and so in 67, he's denied a ticket by the Congress party. And uh, there was a brief period of uh, eclipse. But in 69, he bounces back in a by-election uh, from Bengal with communist support. And in 71, he wins uh, from Kerala, finally, the seat uh, which Shashi Tharoor now holds, without, incidentally, Ambassador, being able to speak, read, or write Malayalam. Yeah. He was able to win this seat uh, from, uh, from Trivandrum purely on the strength of his own personality. But I think he had realized the writing on the wall. So he had, he, had become a, he had become a peace crusader. Uh, he was very much uh, part of Bertrand Russell's anti-Vietnam movement, uh, apartheid. He kept up his links, you know, with the International Peace Brigade. Uh, domestically, he, you know, he participated in parliamentary debates on Bangladesh. Uh, incidentally, yeah. he, uh, he plays a very important role in Bangladesh. And it's not a coincidence that in 2013, when Bangladesh... Uh, honored many distinguished Indians for their contribution, including Indira Gandhi and P.N. Aksa. Krishnamanan also was, was one of them. So he plays a very... so. But by then he had lost any prospect of coming to power. Uh, but that did not prevent American and British intelligence agencies in Delhi from reporting back that Krishnamanan is in the pink of health, alas. You know, he may, because he continued to be a source of great worry uh, to the West. Uh, and uh, that he may come back. Uh, so he was a bugbear as far as the West was concerned. Uh, but he handled himself, I would say, after 1962, very, very... He did not speak against Nehru. Uh, there's a slim volume uh, that uh, he, he spoke in Bombay on India's, India and China, and that got published as a slim volume, which I have re parts of it which I have reproduced in the book. Uh, nobody even knew that he had written that, uh, but... It's lying there in the parliament libraries and nobody has even read it. But it's a nice little uh, description of, you know, from his perspective. And then, of course, he gave this interview to Michael Brescher, which resulted in that book called India and World Politics, which has become standard reading for generations of Indian scholars on politics and, and foreign policy. But yes, I mean, uh, his life was, uh, was eventful, but I think the manner in which he handled his resignation and thereafter was even more eventful. <laughs>